Nathan, one of the big questions we get asked all the time is what is the longest lasting car for the smallest amount of money? Ah, well, good news for you guys. We actually have a list that's gonna provide that very information just for you. Yeah, you're right. So our good friends over at IC Cars sent us a really interesting study they've completed. And let me just read you the email they sent us. Um, new car buyers seeking maximum value should consider vehicles that offer the longest lifespan at the lowest purchase price. The latest IC car study analyzed over 8.3 million new car sales to find out which models fit this criteria. So we've got 25 uh, cars, the best new cars for the money according to their data, um, and a list that can help the budget minor consumer know where to start looking. So here's a key finding, and I want you to keep this number in mind. The average new car costs $2,779 for every 10,000 miles of lifespan it provides. Right? But all top 10 models cost less than $1,700 per 10,000 miles, and we actually have a total of 25 cars we're talking about. So basically what we're looking at is, what is the average lifespan in miles of these cars? What is the average new car price? And if you break it down, what is the price per 10,000 miles? There's a lot of good news here, actually, because nowadays cars do last longer mileage-wise. If you go back 30 years ago, the average car lasted, if you were lucky, 100,000 miles, if you were lucky. Now, I know some of you guys are like, oh, I actually had a slant six that lasted me 350,000 miles. On average, an awful lot of vehicles, and this has to do with build quality and a whole bunch of other things, they weren't as good as they are today. And today, according to this list, they last a lot longer than they did from 30 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the overall average. Um, overall average new car transaction price, 47,885 bucks. Ooh, that's a lot more than I thought. Yeah, so, that hurts. It's a lot of money. And the average lifespan in miles is 172,331. That's good news. Yeah, really good news. Um, you know, and I, it's funny, like, being in, the, like, the old car communities, you talk to folks, like, and it's true, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, it'd be like every 50K, that small block needed a rebuild, right? Yep. Or that little Iron Duke um, needed like a valve job or whatever. And granted, there are were really long lasting cars back new in the day. New torque converter had to go in or something like that. I mean, amazing things had to be done. Right, but new cars are just so much longer lasting uh, if you look at the data, regardless of what people say in the comment section online. Yeah. So let's go to number 25, Nathan. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, it's the Toyota 4Runner. Average new price of a 4Runner, what do you think? $45,000. More. $49,955. Ouch. Yeah. That hurts. So, so it's a lot of money. And the average lifespan in miles, 230,922. You know, that's not much of a surprise. And that has to do with that four liter, which is yeah. legendary. And rightfully so, guys. I mean, you know, the data's right there. And five speed auto, right? Yeah. I, I think so. And another, it's bulletproof. Terrible efficiency, but I mean, a really, really reliable vehicle. And, and the older ones, as Tommy's proven, uh, seem to be pretty tough as well. Yeah, you know, it's, um, they're a really solid made car. And the, the reason that I want to talk about this for a little longer than some of the others, Nathan, is because, you know, we have an insider source of Toyota that has told us a new 4Runner, the 6th gen is going to the Turbo 2.4. No surprise. And folks are really concerned about the longevity of the turbo engine. What do you, what's your take on that? Okay, now, I know some of you guys say TFL stands for Toyota fanboys or whatever. You know, um, we're not paid by Toyota. We're not right? paid, trust me, yeah. we're not. If we were, I'd have a nicer watch. Um, <laughs> but I will say this, Toyota, they have a plan for everything. They don't go to the bathroom without a plan. They don't <laughs> comb their hair without a plan. Everything is planned out and they plan it out long term because they know that their reputation for reliability is one of their biggest sales boons. And they, it's, been, it's been like that for years and years and years. They are known as the reliability company. Even if some of their stuff isn't that reliable, in general, a majority of their vehicles are considered fairly reliable. As such, they tested the hell out of that turbocharged powertrain. They tested the hell out of the hybrid powertrain that connects to it. They've really put it through the ringer. Does that mean it's gonna be perfect? I think there might be a little bit of uh, some teething issues, but that's the whole purpose of the Tacoma. The Tacoma, as it goes through its first year or two, I think they're gonna be able to evaluate that powertrain and then move it towards what they're gonna be doing with the 4Runner. And I think by then, they'll have it absolutely laid out. And 
here's some surprising news that will not surprise you. Toyota's pretty much moving to almost all hybrid yeah. for almost all their vehicles in the very near future. You know, Nathan, I had a really interesting conversation with a powertrain engineer, and I asked him, I said, look, turbos have a reputation, and especially if you look at like the turbos of the 1980s, they had a real <laughs> reputation for blowing up oh, yeah. in a short time span. And I asked him, I said, like, what's changed between 1984 and 2024? And what he said is, first of all, you've got metallurgy, mm. right? And quality of manufacturing has greatly improved. Absolutely. But more importantly than that, it's the fact that the modern turbo engine is designed from the ground up with turbocharging in mind. So a lot of like the 80s applications would have been a naturally aspirated four cylinder that they're bolting a turbo to. The modern engines are designed from the ground up to deal with the higher pressures, to deal with perhaps the higher temperatures and the different loads on the, uh, on the main bearings. And all of these different factors are taken into account from the genesis of that engine from the very start. So they are able to design an engine that is much longer lasting. Um, even like the way that turbos are cooled, right, has improved greatly from just an oil cooled design to water cooled to a mixture of both. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of technology that's really gone into these. Agree 100%, but there's more. Yeah. Because other engineers that I talked to, not Toyota, but Honda, I was asking them about the longevity of hybrid powertrains. Mm. Because a lot of people are like, well, you're, technically you're talking about two different powertrains. You're talking about gas engine, you're talking about electric motor. Right. And that is true. However, one of them said something very interesting. The amount of stress that you put onto a gas engine is slightly minimized by having that electric motor. As such, yeah. the, pot the potential for longevity is there. So just think about that. It's not necessarily a proven fact, but I have a feeling that in 10 years, when we look back at the older hybrids that really started this whole thing, you're going to see an interesting mix of reliability based on the fact that they have that electric motor that takes some of the stress, especially off of starting, yeah. Think about it. The most stress you're putting on your engine, other than when we race them, um, is when you're going from a red light, you're pulling onto the highway, something like that, pounding the accelerator, forcing that engine to do an awful lot of work. Now, if you have electric backup moving you along a little bit, that actually minimizes some of that stress. Now, it doesn't take it all away but I think it helps. The other interesting thing re regarding hybrid reliability, because that was the other tidbit we got, you know, is we're gonna see a hybridized um, Taco uh, Tacoma, obviously we know that, yep. and Forerunner. Um, so Toyota's been doing hybrids for 25 plus years now, right? Right around the turn of the century is when we started to see a mass market hybrid. Here, here in the United here States. Here in the US, yeah. yeah, and Japan actually got a Prius before we got a Prius. Yep. Um, and. I mean, Toyota has really a, a proven track record with reliability, and especially some of the new Priuses, right? Like, you might think 50,000 miles, 100,000 miles to need a new battery, but there's countless Prius owners in our comment section and their emails that have done 150, 200, 250K on the original hybrid battery. And part of that reason is, I mean, if you look at some of the battery technology Toyota's using today in their hybrids, they're not using lithium batteries? No, it's nickel metal hydride. Yeah, yeah, they're using nickel metal hydride batteries, which is like a technology that is older than me. Yeah. It is ancient, and I'm getting pretty old now. Um, <laughs> and for example, like, they're also using such a small capability of that pack. So one of the things about batteries is they don't like to be fully charged, and they don't like to be fully discharged. I was talking to an engineer once, and on the first Prius, that battery pack never was allowed to get below 40% state of charge, and never more than 80. So it's always like in this small range, so it doesn't actually deliver that much um, gross kilowatt hour to the road, but it, it, they do that to, to maintain reliability. So like Nathan, the new Land Cruiser, are you freaked out about the reliability? Because a lot of folks are with that standard hybrid. No, I'm not freaking out about it because once again, I do believe that Toyota may have hit something here. In addition, if you're off-roading, and we've done this before, with a hybrid and you have that electric power pulling you up and over rocks, you have the instantaneous torque or nearly instant torque. Yeah. I think that's great for off-roading. So that's a positive. The negative, of course, is the unknown quantity. How long will this powertrain last? Look, guys, bottom line here is that if you're going to spend that type of money for an off-roader that has unproven technology and you're questioning your purchase, maybe just don't do that. You know, wait until other people actually drive it a little bit. And last, last point too, um, they did do a turbo Forerunner in the 80s. Not a lot they of people did. remember that. It was not a hybrid. It was <laughs> definitely not a hybrid. And it wasn't very fast. I do remember that one quite well. That was the first gen. Right, yeah. yeah. 
So next up on the list, Nathan, coming in at number 24, the Hyundai Tucson. So average new car price for a Tucson, 34,216. Average lifespan in miles, 163,902. So that's a price per 100K, $2,088. That's not bad. The thing about uh, the Tucson is that I, many of us are under the impression that Hyundai is just sort of playing the long game with that one because they're just trying to maintain um, something that is comparable and or competitive with like the CRV and the RAV, uh, RAV4. Um, Hyundai could definitely go a step further if they wanted to. It's, yeah. And I think they will soon. But for now, I mean, the vehicle is, it's affordable. It has a killer warranty. It's not that expensive to maintain. I mean, good for them. And look, I mean, you know, we get a lot of comments that, you know, Hyundai Kia struggle with reliability. And I certainly in the past, I think that was true, but they've really had some big improvements in reliability. Certainly some of their older GDI turbos maybe haven't held up so well. But across the brand, we've seen huge improvements in, in longevity in those, those two brands. That's true. I wouldn't have bought one if I thought that there was an issue. And frankly, that's why I bought a non-turbo without the dual clutch. Yeah. So I mean, you basically a have a Tucson with the bed. That's basically it. Yeah, yeah more and, power. Any problems? No, none with the powertrain. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the automatic transmission was a little, like, it, it, it would sort of delay a little bit with shifting and sort of hold a gear every once in a while, but it seems to be very normal in terms of Hyundais. I've driven other ones that do exactly the same thing. Mm. They don't, it's not super smooth, but it's a lot smoother than the uh, dual clutch. So number 23, Nathan, we got the Ford Escape. Average, yeah. Average new car price, 34 grand. Um, average lifespan, 167,744. And the price per 100,000 miles, 2,031 bucks. I mean, that's you have a bad. lot of experience with it. Your daughter, you bought your daughter an Escape recently. Yeah, I did. With the, but she has the three liter V6. The older one. Which you know, was also in the Mazda, uh, was it Tribute or whatever they called it. Um, that, it's a decent powertrain, good power, not very efficient. Uh, but, I mean, it's a vehicle that I'm pretty sure will last another 50,000 miles. I'm not sure she'll allow it to do that because she's going to hit every curb <laughs> in Boulder, Colorado. I'm not worried about her watching this. Um, but in addition, um, Ford, Ford has taken a platform and they've really done something amazing with it. And that is, I, I think the Escape's a little boring. Okay, mm -hmm. we all do, I think. <laughs> but they managed to build a really cool car out of that. And that, of course, is the Bronco Sport. Yes. Same platform, slightly shortened, really, really cool little vehicle. And I expect to see that vehicle on this list as well because so far, from what I've heard, most of those Bronco Sports are fairly reliable. You know, I don't think it's going to be on the list because it's too new exactly. in terms of average lifespan. I, Ford, I, I think they put themselves in a little bit of a pickle, though, because the, they made the Bronco Sport so good where I really don't think the Escape needs to exist anymore. I think I agree with you. And in addition, I think Ford agrees with you. Rumor has it they're going to discontinue it soon. Do you remember, like, the first Escape oh. was, like, this really square, boxy... Kind yeah. of rugged. Well, like my daughter's. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, yeah good point. Um, you know, they kind of went back to that with the Bronco Sport. It seems like people are really excited and happy with that decision. Bronco Sport sells extremely well. Yep. I mean, the only reason in my mind to get an Escape over a Bronco Sport is if you absolutely have to have the hybrid or the plug-in hybrid. Yeah. But, um, but then just do it by Toyota. Seriously. It's, be better. it's a little bit bigger, too. It's a slightly longer wheelbase. Mm. I don't know if it holds that much more because the thing about the Bronco Sport is it's very square. It's, it's a box, box. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as opposed to sort of a rounded design on the Escape. But I think the Escape still might have a little bit more space and a, I think it has a longer wheelbase as well. But in general, I mean, it's a perfectly good vehicle, but it's very average. Honestly speaking, I was aiming for a Toyota RAV4 mm. when I bought my daughter's uh, Escape. The reason I did that is because RAV4s here in Colorado, at least, for the price I was looking at, 150 to 200,000 miles on them, yeah. right? And I'm like, no, I need something that has less than 100,000 miles, please. So, And at least with those older escapes, it's another one. Like I had a friend in college that had a first gen, 250, 260,000 miles, ran like a top. Yep. You know, right? That was that, you were talking about that Mazda partnership. Um, it's a great car. Yeah. Really, really good. And super cheap. Um, so going back to Hyundai, Nathan. Now, of course, we're talking about kind of price per 100K related to the lifespan. So a lot of these cars are going to be on the more affordable side of things. 
Hyundai Elantra 25,634 is the average new car price for that vehicle. Uh, uh, average lifespan 126, 863, so a little down compared to some of the cars on the list. Mm -hmm. But because that car comes in at affordable price, we're still looking at a $2,000, um, essentially just a $2,021 price per 100K for an Elantra. I mean, you think about that over the long term, that's not bad at all. Yeah, it's pretty Especially good. Especially for a car. Once again, Hyundai's, they have killer warranties. I mean, we're, they're not the best. They're really good, though, for especially people who are looking at a long-term solution for ownership. Are they still doing the 10-year? 10 10-year, 100,000 mile, but it's not bumper to bumper. Mm. Powertrain, and then I think it's 336, uh, which is bumper to bumper, but that's not necessarily standard. I think that they have two different warranties that they offer for that. Okay. I don't, I don't know that world too well, but mm. I know that it was an amazing... Um, Warranty when they first offered it. Such a good it idea. It still is, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, that's what they're known for, right? I mean, Hyundai and Kia, you know that they have that big, beefy warranty. At one point, they were talking about getting rid of it, and I'm really glad they didn't because this sort of maintains a little bit of their credibility, right? I did a story a while back. Um, you may have written it up, actually. Um, there was a, a gal who drove pharmaceuticals. She was like a delivery driver, mm -hmm. and she had a, um, uh, an Elantra, with a, she had a like a bull bar customized for because she kept hitting deer, like in the rural, <laughs> rural roads. But she drove it to a million miles. No kidding. Yeah, and and as a publicity thing, Hyundai gave her a brand new car. You know that happens a lot. This is a life hack I've noticed. If you want a brand new car for free, it seems like the best way to do that. Drive a million. A miles. million miles. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. Tundra guy got a new car. Uh, Volvo, Volvo guy got the a new Volvo car. The Volvo guy yes, got a did. new car. Yeah. Uh, there was a Nissan guy too. A Frontier. The Frontier guy. Yeah, he got one too. Yeah. The so. Frontier guy. That kind of backfired on him though, because that was like an 05 that he bought, mm -hmm. and in like 2019 they gave him a new truck. Yeah. And it looked the same. Yeah, because he didn't <laughs> wait. He, he should have waited maybe one more year before he told Nissan. Yeah, right. Maybe two more years, you know, it, so he got the new one. It backfired for Nissan because they're like, "Have our new truck," and then all the media were like. It's, it's the same it, as the old truck. It's the same <laughs> damn truck, guys. Yeah. I, I, felt, I felt kind of bad for the guy. It was at the Chicago show, I think, it was when Something they did like the presentation. That. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, so let's move on. Uh, 21, Nathan. We got the Mazda CX-9. $43,448 average new car price. 216,000 miles lifespan. Holy cow. First car, over, oh, second car over 200,000. And that breaks down to $2,009 price per 100K. 10K. If it's the V6, mm -hmm. that V6 was really good. Mm. And I remember, um, oh, um, producer Zach's not here today. Yeah. Sorry, buddy. It's his favorite uh, topic, our Mazdas. Um, I know the four-cylinder turbo is pretty decent, but that V6 that they had in the older uh, first generation was, good. was really good. I mean, it's just, just a strong engine, not the most efficient, but it was really strong. Um, and I have a feeling that because of all the years that they've pulled this together, some of those are the V6 models. But that's a pretty damn good number, considering that this is a very fairly large SUV. Yeah, and um, I, it's comfortable. It's well made. It's got pretty good room. Yeah, the newer ones are really stylish. Even if you don't get the brand new new one, even the older ones are really, really, really good looking. Actually, right now is a good time to buy a CX-9 because the CX-90 is out there. Yeah, and the CX-9s, a lot of people are trying to move them off the lot because the CX-90 is, you know, the premier vehicle. Yeah. All right, Nathan. So moving on to the Rav4, um, comes in at the number twenty spot. Mm. It's a little low, a little lower on the list than I thought. But yeah, I thought too. Uh, so strange. Thirty-five thousand dollars, three hundred and fifty-nine is the uh, average new car price, so 35,359. Um, average lifespan is just over 178,000 miles, breaking down to 1,983 price per 10K. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's not a surprise that we see the RAV4 on the list. No, no. One of the best-selling vehicles that Toyota builds. One of the best-selling vehicles in the U.S. It's in its class, it's the best. Uh, the only thing that outdoes it are, like, the Ford F-Series. or That's it. Yeah, or some you know, pickup trucks, That's basically. It. Yeah. That's it. Um, it is absolutely, uh, uh, you know, they knocked it out of the park, and they have for years. Um, they were one of the earlier ones to the segment, and really the only competitor they have, really, truly, is Honda. Hmm. So, you know, we talked about the Tucson, which is a little further down on the list, yeah. and the Kia. The Honda and the Kia are both good. Talked about the Escape, also on this list. The car that I'm struggling with in that class, we were talking about this just the other night, um, is the Hornet. You know, how do you think we're going to look back on that car in 10, 15 years? This is what I said when I drove it. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, I liked the GT a lot more than the plug-in hybrid, which has more power, a lot more power, but the GT is a better driver. It will be the sports car of the crossover class. Definitely, right. It's fast. It's really quick, and it handles quite well, I think. It's kind of like a very tall WRX, older one. Um, that's the positive. 
The negative is quality is not quite there. I don't think the design is all that great. Um, and I really feel bad for the people at Stellantis, especially Alfa Romeo, because rumor has it that the guys at Alfa Romeo tooth and nail fought for that vehicle not to be built because it's like they just made a discount version of this vehicle that they sweated and put time into, the Tonale, mm -hmm. or Tonel as you put it. You, I still can't get that out of my head. <laughs> That's your fault. Um, but um, I would say that it's the sports car of the class, not the best in class other than power. Yeah. It's, it's a power. It's, it's really quick. That's about the best thing I can say about it. Um, and the plug-in hybrid doesn't make any sense to me at all. So you're right. It's the hot rod of that class. Yeah. I mean, turbo power really moves. But my question is, so like your daughter just graduates, is graduating college. She gets like her first real job or she's making a lot of money. She wants to buy a small crossover. Yeah. Um, as are like a lot of my friends kind of in that same boat. Um, is she really going to prioritize speed when she's in the market for a compact crossover? Do you think people are doing that? Some. Okay. Some. And I think it depends on where they are. Uh, consider this. Uh, there are different parts of the nation that favor different vehicles. So, for instance, you're going to sell more Dodge vehicles in certain regions, right, than you would, say, Toyotas or Nissans in that same region for various reasons. Um, you know, the, the public wants an American-built vehicle or something along those lines. There are some people who are actually looking for that name. Mm -hmm. I want a Dodge. I don't want a Toyota. That type of thing. My daughter, no, she won't. Uh, I, I can tell you right now, she's not thrilled about driving a Ford. In her mind, she wants to drive a Japanese vehicle. She's been asking me about that quite a bit because she knows the reputation of Japanese auto automakers and she feels that that's the vehicle she should be driving because she wants the best reliability after she's done with college. So she's not a very good example. However, <laughs> I can tell you right now. Well, I think... That's pretty common, though. I yeah, mean, a no, lot of people right, are right. going to buy in that class because they're not enthusiasts. They just want the best, highest quality product. Exactly. And they want to go from point A to point B. And if they're buying a crossover, maybe they live in this type of climate that we live in. And if we were able to turn the cameras around, you'd see snow covering everything. Right. Um, because having all-wheel drive and having some decent ground clearance, it's great. It's, it's a good thing to have up here. However, um, let's say you live, I don't know, in Florida is a really good example but you really want to cross over. Mm -hmm. And you've driven a Subaru, you've driven a Honda, a Hyundai, a few others, and it's just, they're not fun. The Hornet's fun. The GT yeah, is, fun, yeah. is pretty fun. So in my book, if you're in that type of environment and you really don't need to conquer the snow, so to speak, but you, need, you want to have a crossover, that might be the place for it. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're pretty spot on the money. So, Nathan, moving on to number 19, breaking through the top 20. We've got the Subaru Outback, 39809 average new car price, average lifespan, 202,000 miles. People buy Subarus. They drive them a long time. And under 2K per 10,000 mile. Um, number 18, this is a car I, I've completely forgotten about, I'm embarrassed to say, the Chevrolet Malibu. The, uh, they're still building them too, aren't they? Well, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know, um, but because they haven't changed it in X amount of years, I'm going to see if you can I'm get a 2024 sure Malibu. You, I'm, I bet you you can. But I'm also willing to bet that's an that old car. It is. They went to turbo power uh, when they came out with this newer generation. They and are. They're still building it. Yeah, it's a fleet car. It really is a popular fleet car. Uh, the last one I drove, I actually had to. I had to rent one. Okay. Um, well, no, actually, I didn't. Uh, the the dealership gave me one because it was just on the lot. It's technically a rental. I drove it around, and I actually liked the power. The power was good. The interior was fine. Um, just it, it just it doesn't really tick any boxes in terms of like, hey, woohoo, fun. But it's it, cheap. It was quicker than any Camry that I can remember, other than maybe a V6. Yeah. It was quick. Yeah, they, they, and they're comfortable. They're pretty comfortable. Yeah, I had no problem with it. I loved the old Impala. That was cool. The, the previous, you know, which yeah. also had that, I think it was the same powertrain, that turbo, which, which was available in it. And I liked that one because that was big and long and it's kind of like had the old cruiser feel to it, sort of. Sort of. Sort of. But the Malibu, not so much. The Malibu is just, it does its job and it does it fairly well. And apparently it's uh, a pretty um, efficient vehicle to own, both financially and um, in terms of reliability. I'm curious. I'm, I'm just poking around our area here. Mm. I mean, and sure enough, like you can pick up a brand new 24 Malibu, 25, 26 grand, 27, 
27, 26. So like it's an affordable way to get yourself into a new large sedan. And I'm pretty sure I recall, cause I did have to put gas in it, that you don't even have to put the high grade gas, even though it's a turbo. I think it's, it's fine with regular grade. Large ish sedan. And apparently they're lasting, well, they're doing okay. Lasting 142,000 miles. So anything under over a hundred, as far as I'm concerned, is pretty decent. Doing okay. So number 17, another Subaru, the Forester. Average transaction price, 36,000, uh, 194,000 miles. Um, 1, I still think it's their best car, by the way. Forster's good. I think it's the best thing that they built, other than maybe the WRX. So, as you guys know, we don't talk too much about Subarus because they don't work with us. Yeah. But we do drive viewers' cars, we buy them occasionally, and I've spent a little bit of seat time in the current Forester Wilderness, and I really liked it a lot. It yeah, really yeah, well, you, you, you absolutely killed it off-road On that the slip thing. test, it was great. The new Forester, I don't love the design, it's a little roly-poly. Mm. But the old one was really a pretty good car. Yeah. Um, I would love to drive one for more than a few hours, Subaru. Um, number 16, the Honda Ridgeline, Nathan. Yeah, Ridgeline. Now, this is the number that gets me, okay? Mm -hmm. I think that this is the highest number on the entire list, at least the top 25, of the average lifespan of a Ridgeline is 243,431 miles. There's a caveat, because there were a couple issues with the the first gen, but the second transmission that they had or something like that. And then, no, no, the second gen and the first transmission they had before they moved to the newer transmission that they're currently using. I think there was an issue with that one. There was a minor recall, I believe, and that's it. I mean, this vehicle, for the most part, I've seen them. I looked at some used ones as well. Yeah. Um, they're rocking it, absolutely rocking it. One of the most reliable built, uh, vehicles built in its class. There aren't that many pickup trucks that can pull that off in its class considering what you're getting for the money. So I, I think it's just a wonderful vehicle. Well done, Honda. Now it's one of the more expensive average new car prices yeah. on this list, 44,000. Um, price per 100K though is only 1,800 because they last so darn long. You look, the Ridgeline is, um, and, and you'll say because it's, I'm a little fruity, but it's one of my favorite trucks on the market. I mean, it is such a daily drivable, usable, yes. comfortable, it's the most comfortable mid-sized truck. It's got good power out of that NAV6. It's got yeah. a good all-wheel drive system. It's not like a true low-range four-wheel drive off-road. No, but it's the IVTM4, basically. It's and great. It's, it's Port factoring rear diff. Excellent, excellent all-wheel drive system, not an off-roader. The only reason I didn't buy one of those instead of buying the Santa Cruz that I bought yeah. was because it was about $3,000 above my absolute cap. Okay. And I just could not convince my wife to go that far. But it has one of the most comfortable back seats in its class. Great. That's not a debate. That's a fact. It's a very easy car to drive every day. And yeah, it, it's a car. But it has a very usable bed that has the same, if not better, uh, payload than a lot of vehicles in it, uh, the Toyota, Tacoma, and all those other ones. And it tells about 5,000 pounds. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's if, not bad. If you wanna do, you gotta ask yourself, are you buying yourself your truck, your mid-size truck especially, because yeah. you're actually doing truck stuff, or are you buying it because you think you're gonna do truck stuff? I'd wager 80% are in the second category, in the mid-size segment. Um, and honestly, the, the Ridgeline's quieter than yep. any, any truck in its, its class. It's very quiet. It's more comfortable. By easy a long to shot. drive, yeah. easy to park. And one final thing about it, um, it, fairly efficient, almost the most efficient in its class, although that's changing with all the hybrids that are coming out and everything else. Um, and Honda really needs to go hybrid on this thing, I think, in the future. But their sales have increased year over year. And now they actually have outsold several competitors in the midsize truck bracket. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind. Yeah, I um, I love I love that that yeah, it's line. a really good Ridge line. So yeah. moving on to number fifteen, we got the Nissan Sentra, um, coming in at uh, twenty three nine six nine average new car price. Average lifespan is one thirty four three three five. Mm. Um, yeah, it's That's one on of the, the lower, lower numbers yeah, yeah, yeah. on the list. But yeah. it's still and, and you I, I will bet money it probably is the transmission, but. Um, the four cylinder thing is just a little ticker that goes on and on and on. They do not sell a manual transmission anymore. They used to with the Nismo model. Right. Um, I think that was an option, but it's been a long time since then. So for the most part, you're getting a four cylinder CVT. And I think the best seats in the class, if you get the higher end one, yeah. I love those zero gravity seats. I, 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 as I said before, I drank the Kool-Aid. I really think they're comfortable. I actually think that the Nissan Sentra has 
more comfortable seats than almost any vehicle in its class. I really truly do. Good back seat too. I just did. I was just doing some math here on my phone, Nathan. And um, I mean, the reason that it's so high up on the list is because even though it's not one of the longer lasting cars on the list, the average new car price is pretty low, right? So it's it's back. It's half the price of what the average new car price is right that's now. That's crazy. I mean, think about it. Yeah, you're right. You're exactly right. Twenty three compared to forty seven thousand. It's half the price. I mean, seriously. And yeah. for those people who don't live up in a place where they need to have all-wheel drive, it's a very efficient car. It's not fast, but it does the job. And it's also a good seller for Nissan. Although, once again, rumor has it that Nissan is starting to taper off on their car production. I hear the Ultima is going away very soon. And I think that the Sentra might follow it. Number 14, the Toyota Camry Hybrid. Average new car price, 35631 Average lifespan, as you'd expect in Toyota, over 200,000 miles. Not a surprise. 201 644 and that brings the price per 10K down to 1767 Camry Hybrid, it's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a great Uber car. It, it is. It's, it's comfy-ish. It, it just does everything well. Yeah. And right now, now, now they're about to change it, and it's going to be a very different Camry next year. Next year is going to be only hybrid, so mm -hmm. it's only the four-cylinder Atkin cycle, four-cylinder uh, hybrid, but you can get it all-wheel drive or just front drive. This is great. CBT, or eCBT, I think is yeah, what they were calling it. Luckily, yeah. it's not like a cone with a belt. It's like, a, <laughs> like more like a planetary set. Planetary setup. gear set, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, the solid car, sad to say, the eight-speed connected to that wonderful V6 is you Gone. liked that thing, didn't you? I liked it. I, I really did. It, it, it just, it hummed, you know what I mean? It just had a little, it reminded me of my past, you know, like it had a growl to it and it kind of felt like it enjoyed being revved and pushed a little bit. And it made, I think, over 300 horsepower. Camry V6s, I mean, if you look at like the history of the V6 Camry, I just did a story at, at the Toyota headquarters about the evolution of the Camry, um, but they've been historically a lot of horsepower for the money. Yeah. Um, when like the... It was like the 2007 era Camry launched. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was right around 2007. Um, they had a V6 in that generation that was quicker to 60 than the equivalent WRX. I mean, that thing was a monster. It was a monster. I think that same V6 graduated to the uh, RAV4. Right. That was and, also fast. And it was really, really fast. Also and we fast. saw a race. Do you remember the Audi race? Oh, God. It was, a, it was on an oval uh, track that, that we used, well, we kind of used a little bit. Uh, where was that? In, it was the Colorado Speedway. Yeah, the yeah. Colorado Yeah. They did like a run what you brung thing. Yeah. During the... and this, this RAV4, which was completely, uh, just absolutely unmodified vehicle, went out there and destroyed a, a, a what was it, a, an S4? Yeah, it was an S4. It was a um, V6 Mustang. S197 and the Raptor and this stupid little V6 RAV4 just actually ate them. I think I don't know if it did it beat the the Raptor as well. Uh, yeah, it came in first. It was hysterical. It was a V862 Raptor. Um, the guy knew how to drive, but like we had a joke around the office that the fastest car in the world was the like two generation the last V6 RAV4 that right. they did. Um, that thing hauled ass. It was ridiculously quick. It was so powerful and it was hysterical. Some of the earliest TFL videos that we put together, Roman and I went off road with that and also a, uh, a Hyundai um, Forester. Hyundai. Tucson? No, a Subaru, Subaru Forester. Forester. Okay. I'm not used to saying those words anymore. And we took him off road, this place we used to go to in Left Hand Canyon. And I remember we were bashing around in this thing and it just took it. And it had so much more power than anything else we were driving at the time. And you could really feel the difference up here. Yeah, great car. Um, it's actually a little slower than the new RAV4 Prime, but you got this V6 growl and it's so it felt so fast. Yeah, well, our, our camera guy just got one. Yeah, I mean, we, and it's just like a blur of light when he drives out of here. <laughs> it's, yeah, he, well, he's got to get out and get, you know, his Celsius down the street. Yeah, he's he got to go buy that, that can. And, <laughs> yeah, so sorry. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Yeah, next up, Nathan, another Toyota, probably the least surprising car on this list. It's the Tacoma. Um, a really high average lifespan. Also, not surprising, 239,000 miles. Average new car price, 41 grand, and that brings the price per 10K to 17.46. I mean, once again, another powertrain that is well known, and I don't think it's, I wonder if they're putting those numbers together with also the older four liter. I don't know the how they, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the thing, question. I'm, I'm kind of curious about that, but um, that's about to go away as well. 
Uh, and as a matter of fact, you're not going to have the options that you had even right now, which is uh, right now you can get the V6 or there's a four cylinder and that's not going to happen. You're only going to have a turbo four or later on the hybrid four turbo. Uh, but you will be able to get a manual transmission, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, come on, we all know this. The, the Tacoma is solid, really, really solid. I'm hoping that this moves to the next generation Tacoma, which we've recently done a lot of testing with. So this says, um, I see cars analyzed over 8.3 million new cars sold in December, September through December of 2023, and the odometer readings of over 181 million used cars. So lots of data that these folks crunched yeah. in I see cars. Um, so it's an interesting, interesting, um, interesting. So Nathan, um, I want to take a pause from the yes. best new cars for the money list. And you actually came up with your own Nathan list. Well, I wanted to talk to you guys about something that some of, every once in a while I hear people ask me, which is, what is the slowest car that looks fast? Or what's the car that disappointed you that you thought was fast based on the way it looks, mm -hmm. but was really slow? It's like a reverse sleeper. Exactly, a reverse sleeper. A waker. So I had a little list that I came up with here, and I'm, I wonder if Tommy agrees with me. So the first one... Um, now, for those of you who are going to argue, yell, and scream, bear in mind that I understand that many of these cars have different powertrains that are available, so I'm only referring normally to their base powertrain. Okay. okay. Lexus IS. Yes, looks very sporty. Mm -hmm. And there is, of course, Lexus IS 500, 400, 500, whatever 500, it is, yeah. 500, mm -hmm. which puts out like 475 horsepower, 472, or whatever it is. That's an animal, and we love it. However... There's also a two-liter that puts out 241 horsepower. Yeah. Not enough. <laughs> Not enough. Yeah. And it looks... It, it looks fast. It looks quick, especially if you had, like, some of the F-Sport models, but it's not that quick. It, uh, that's the F-Sport is the problem. Mm. You, you put all that stuff on there and really jazz it up, and, man, it looks like an animal. And then people who are in naturally aspirated cars are, like, looking at you and going, yeah, you're not really that fast. Um, that's an issue. The next one is the Mazda Miata MX-5. Yeah, well, it's a classic car. It's a, it, fast, it is one not... of the best driving cars around for cornering and everything else, but off the line, especially the RF, because the RF's heavier with that uh, retractable uh, heavy roof, um, not fast. Nathan, do you want to tell a quick story about your experience in the uh, Miata with a certain Alex Dykes in California? My buddy Alex Dykes. From Alex Dykes. Now, Alex <laughs> is not much shorter than I am. I think he's about six feet tall. Mm -hmm. And so he, I mean... He, he's not a small person, and obviously I'm not either. And he and I had to drive uh, up the coast of California. And he's a great driving partner with the exception of his musical taste. Alex, if you're watching, love you, man, but come on. Um, and we stuffed ourselves into a Miata RF for the duration. Now, whoever was driving was fine. You know, it was a little bit, you're, you're still a little cramped, but the person in the passenger seat, you see, the footwell moves inward, so your feet are at this weird angle or they're pushed together. And so it kind of, especially for a big guy, kind of forces your whole body to contract in a very uncomfortable fashion. I felt like I was inside the womb once again, but not in a good way. <laughs> and so trying to maintain a conversation with Alex, who's extremely sharp, and he, you know, facts, facts, facts. He's like Tommy when Tommy was younger, oh, I've known you for a while. He's way smarter than me. No, oh, but yeah. you remember, you, you really were like, you know, facts, 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 facts. And so he's like that, but even more so, he's like on Red Bull all the time with the facts. So imagine trying to keep up with him as we're driving, flying down the highway while I'm in the passenger seat like this. You know, I agree with you, Alex, 100%. Even if I didn't agree with him, I wanted to agree with him just to minimize the pain. Um, I mean, you were like covered in luggage, right? God, yeah. Well, we had to put all our luggage in the car, too. So... Whatever we couldn't fit in the trunk, and there's not a lot, because retractable uh, hardtop, <laughs> the rest of it had to come in with us. Oh, so no. in addition, I have like a, a backpack on my lap, and you know, I j it was bad. And I'm not very good at being in tight spaces, big surprise. So yeah, that was a difficult trip. And Alex um, has a pretty professional operation with his camera gear, and he's got like these very professional <laughs> like square boxes, but... You're not going to fit many of those in, no. a, in the truck of a no, Miata. I think we had to actually finally ask Mazda to carry, to carry one of the extra things for like us. Like a chase car, yeah. Yeah, they, they actually had to. So the next one on the list is a vehicle we just recently had and I'm kind of disappointed with, and that is the Nissan Nismo Z. Mm. 
now that's an interesting one because the standard Z is already pretty quick. It's pretty quick. And the Nismo you'd expect to have crazy more ha power, but it's like 20 or 30 more horsepower, right? Which compensates for the fact that they put a bunch of extra stuff on there. It's got a much beefier suspension and brakes and everything Which is else. cool, but it, it looks like it should have 600 horsepower. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if I put it up against a Mustang D GT with a, you know minor goodies on it, the Mustang GT will be comparable to it right. in my book. The one we have in our garage right now, yeah. I think would be more than adequate to keep up with it, if not beat it, in addition to the fact that it's a lot less expensive. It's, uh, just, it's really disappointing and it's not as fast as it looks. It's a good one, I agree. The next one is, they no longer uh, sell them in the United States, which is a bit of a shame. It's the Hyundai Veloster, but not the end. Oh, relax, yeah. guys, relax. Shh. I know the end is really quick and awesome. I'm talking about the base model, which had like 147 horsepower. Mm. Not enough, because that car really looks fast. Even the base model looks fast, and it's a fun car to drive around a corner. But holy cow, 147 horsepower, not enough. You know, it didn't have a lot of beans. That's a really good one, yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if they did an end line. I want to say they did. And that one with the base engine is not going to be very sporty. I think it was a 2021. Did they do 2022. the... 2022. It's 2021, I think. I'm full, here, I'm going to look yeah, it up. Yeah. line. I don't want to... Yeah. That's the problem. The end line and the end. They, they're pulling the same thing that a lot of other manufacturers are doing where they have, you know, AMG badging or M badging or, well, you know, to, uh, Lexus with the uh, F. F thing. It really drives me crazy. But I know a lot of you guys are like, well, wait a minute. I don't want a sporty car, but I love the way the sporty car looks. I totally get that. Hence this list. Um, I don't think there was a thing I'm wrong. But there was the end, which was actually properly fast. Oh, that was that properly was cool. fast. But, but and they didn't sell any. <laughs> I mean, there are so few of those on the road. And I think it's a shame. That thing was a real driver. Final car on this list, very short list, is the Dodge Challenger GT. Okay, interesting one. Looks great. Love the way the Challenger looks. Uh, the GT is all-wheel drive. Just fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. 300 horsepower, 306 I think is the total output. Not enough. Because it's a heavy car. <laughs> it's, it's like three of these. Right. Um, it's, it's really heavy and um, it's fine around a corner. You can feel the heft, but what you really feel the heft is when, you, especially when you're up here at high elevation, and you're out of light and you hit the accelerator and it's just like, yeah, not a lot happening. The biggest miss with that car is, um, I actually think that the Challenger in general is um, that the fact that they never sold from the factory the V8 with the eight speed and the all-wheel drive. And that was, I mean, there was like a couple of like SEMA concepts that, that did that, which yeah. was really cool. Some people have done it in the aftermarket. Um, and there were a lot of reasons we heard as to why they couldn't do it. Like Weight and price is what I've heard. Well, yeah, and you hear like, so the, the, the pre-face of Charger, you could get the V8 five-speed um, all-wheel drive, which is actually what's in their cop car up there. Mm -hmm. But then when they, when they went to the eight-speed, they said, well, packaging, you know, it doesn't fit. I heard the starter's in the wrong place from an engineer once. But the reality was like people made it work, making it happen. I would imagine it comes down to cost yep. of development at the end of the day. I think so. But if you could get like a 6.4 or a Hellcat with all-wheel drive, that would have transformed the car. Well, yeah, basically what you're doing is you're taking like a track hawk from the Jeep and you're just, yeah. slap, you know, slapping on a Challenger body on it. That's a good point. That would have been freaking awesome. Durango track hawk had an 8-speed with all-wheel drive. Yeah, it was a monster. Put it in the, in the sedans, in the coupe. You yeah. might have to mix the hood around. The one thing I thought they missed out on was the, uh, taking the 6-speed manual transmission and hooking it up to the V6 mm. and making like a fun little, you know, inexpensive entry level version of the vehicle. I think that that V6 with that manual transmission would have been a little bit more fun. Yeah. They never ever built that. I, um, I remember we had a test car. I fell in love with it because it looked so cool. It was like a 2017 or 18 Challenger, bright orange. It had like this racing stripe down the side, this beautiful wheels on it. Mm -hmm. um, it was a GT, so it had some cool GT components. Uh, all wheel drive, but it was a V6, and it just didn't drive as it good as it looks. It just doesn't looked. look as good. Yeah, it doesn't drive as good as it looks. I would still own one, happily, because I really do enjoy driving Challengers. They fit me nicely, but at the same time, just not quick. Yep. Not quick. So we're going to transition back to the top 12 best new cars for the money. And number 12, coming in an average new car price of 25778 lasting an average of 148,000 miles, is the Volkswagen Jetta. 
I'm really surprised to see Volkswagen on this list. Um, they have not maintained a very good reliability record throughout the most of their vehicles. They've been mediocre, I think, is the way to put it. Hmm. So I'm glad to see that there. Um, Jetta GLI is still a great car that not many people buy and a lot of fun, and it's going to go away pretty soon. Uh, um, yeah, and the, you know the GLI is still relatively affordable. It's I like think you could still get one with a stick too. Twenty-seven, yeah, you can still with a stick. Which the GTI no longer does. Yeah, they just announced the discontinuation of that. I, I agree, Nathan. I mean, it's a it's a good car. It's uh, the Jetta just doesn't bring a whole lot to the table right now. It's a little dated. Yeah. It's okay value, okay tech, but not that fantastic. They got that little one. Is it one point four liter turbo on yeah, their base I model? Yeah, I think so. And I think you can get like a sport or something like that with the manual transmission. We had one once. It's a five speed. Yeah, I remember that. And that was a, that was a fun, was fun little car. Yeah, for the money. And it was and it was very affordable for what it was. I don't know if you can still get that one, but it was either, fun yeah. when it was around. Yeah. yeah. A Subaru Legacy is next on the list, coming in at thirty-two eighty-nine. Good job, Subaru, for being on this list multiple times. Yeah, their their qualities are doing pretty well. Yeah, the, the ages of blown head gaskets at fifty k must be well over. <laughs> yeah, um, average lifespan is one eighty-nine six zero three. That's good. And yeah. now to the top ten, Nathan. Yeah. Um, number ten, uh, of course, another hybrid vehicle. We got the Prius. Average new car price thirty-five three one three. Average lifespan, talk about long-lasting hybrids, 209,000 miles coming in, price per 100K at 1,683. You know, uh, Brendan and I did a video recently where we compared the, one of the older Priuses to the brand new one. And uh, that Prius that we were looking at, I think, had like 240,000 miles on it. Wow. Yeah, it smelled like it, too. And the <laughs> gross. And there's, um, you know, when you talk about hybrid battery replacement, there's so many hundreds of thousands, probably millions of Priuses at this point on the road where when they do fail, there is an aftermarket community that has popped up to replace the batteries, be it with recycled, rebuilt packs, whatever, um, for a relatively affordable cost. You know, so like these headlines, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for a new EV battery. Yeah, that's, yeah. For, for, okay, first of all, way blown out of proportion. But second of all, like on a Prius, depends on the generation, but a couple grand, $3,000 in some cases, can usually get you into at least a rebuilt battery pack that'll last you another 150,000 miles. Well, that's the point is for those of you people who really don't want to go out and buy a brand new car with that type of upgrade, as long as you keep oil in the damn thing, it'll just keep on going. Yeah, they're gr great cars, yeah. long lasting. Um, and really solidified hybrids in America. Number nine, Nathan, the Mazda 3. Average new car price, a relatively low $30,000. Average lifespan, 184,000 miles. And the price per 100K is 1644 Now, I've owned a Mazda 3. I also had a, a Mazda 5, which is the Mazda 3 minivan, essentially. Um, <laughs> the manual you, Mazda 5, Yeah, right? it is. Yeah. My wife wanted a manual. She only drives manual transmissions. Um, and that van... <sighs> It wasn't a van. It was, it was a wagon, really. That thing, oh, she abused it terribly, and it still somehow made it over 100,000 miles. I mean, she drove over an open manhole. Oh, man. She slammed into a curb. She went over a speed bump that is in one of those neighborhoods that's trying to dissuade you from going over 20. Yeah. At about 80, I swear oh, to God. God. She got air. Um, she's not watching this. Uh, so, and it took it. Think about Mazda. I think Mazda's are still on the slightly delicate side sometimes depending on the vehicle, but those Mazda 3s are solid, solid little cars. They're well-built, they're well, I think they're extremely efficient for the class. Yeah, And I think that there's some, drive. yeah, there's some of the funnest car, funnest, the most exciting cars to drive in their class given how much you're paying for them. Right. And that's going throughout almost the entire lineup of Mazdas. I think they're great and it's a great car maker. It's just a shame because they have, their dealer um, accessibility is a real issue. Yeah, and you know, also one of the only cars we can get in that class with all-wheel drive. Yeah. Turbo power, um, if you want it, the, the new one, you know. It's a good car. You had, was yours new, your gray one? Uh, oh, the, the, the silver, silver one. one. Yeah, yeah. Right. no, that was like one year used. What happened to that car? Uh, my wife beat it up quite a bit, and then it, the hailstorm came. Oh. Remember, that also wiped out that, that, that Cadillac I, I, I was driving around in. It also uh, kind of wiped out my wife's car, and... We got a really good offer, uh, and we traded it actually for her Mini. Oh. She wanted a car okay. that had all-wheel drive, and that was a little bit more fun, yeah, and she deserved it, and, and the Mini was more fun. Yeah. All right, Nathan, number eight on the list, the Honda CRV. So, you know, we talked about the RAV4 earlier on. We talked about the Tucson. Well, yep. the CRV's up here higher than both of those, coming in at 35490 average new car price. Mm-hmm. 
average lifespan, 219,000 miles, and that brings the price per 10K down to 16.17. I'm curious to whether or not the newer turbos are part of that. I, I guess they are. Yeah, they, they would be. be. Yeah, they'd be on that list. And, uh, you know, some people talk about oil consumption issues and whatnot. I've, I've seen a few emails and whatnot where people talk about that. But for the most part, as far as I can tell, the CRV is a solid vehicle. Yeah, really well made car. Yeah. Uh, you know, roomy, good technology. It's great. It's the reason that they sell hundreds of thousands every year. Yep. Uh, seven, Nathan, the Nissan Versa. Average new car price, 20601 over twenty k for a Versa now. Yeah. Um, average lifespan is, I think, unfortunately, one of the lower on the list at 129 um, almost 120, uh, 130,000 miles, uh, and then that brings the price per 10K down to 1585. Oh no, 1588. Okay. Inexpensive, very economical, wonderful rental car. I, I mean, seriously, that's, I cannot, the Versa, especially the first gen, oh my God, it was the car I absolutely despised because I hated the design. Mm. The Note was okay, but the regular Versa, I couldn't stand it's that design. It's so droopy, the oh, older it was ones. Terrible, yeah. terrible. But in terms of you know, an entry-level car that's going to give you around 10 years worth of good use if you drive average mileage, that car is okay. Yeah, um, it's cheap. It's cheap. It does its job. You know what's interesting? It actually technically has more backseat space than the Sentra. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, it's it, measurement-wise, but not necessarily usable-wise. You know what I mean? I, I think the current generation is more attractive than yeah, the droopy it's one. It's okay. The droopy one, I remember when it launched, you went with my dad, it was like 11000 starting. It was the least expensive car in America, with the exception of number one on your list. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. but the Versa, for, for a short time, it held that title. Mm -hmm. Five-speed manual, remember, like it crank windows, no yep. power locks. The thing I was think, basic. It, was, it was crazy, it was like... I think there was one that had like the front windows were power, but the rear were cranked really? or something like that. It was weird. So let, let me know in the comments below if you guys remember that. I, I'm pretty sure that they had that version. Um, so number six on the list, back to a Camry, this time the non-hybrid. It's a little higher on the list because it's a little more affordable than the uh, Camry hybrid. You know what's really cool about current uh, Camrys? You can get an all-wheel drive one with a four-cylinder. That's cool. Unfortunately, you cannot get a V6 with all-wheel drive. Yeah, or the I don't think in the current you get the hybrid with all-wheel drive. It's only the so. base engine. Only the base, yeah. yeah. So it's but it's it's, it's a decent car, man. So thirty-one six ninety is the average new car price. Over two hundred thousand lifespan miles as well, and then price per ten k is one thousand five hundred eighty-five. Not bad. News and moving to the top five, Nathan. Yeah. Coming in at number five, we got the Honda Civic. $28,594 average new car price. Average lifespan is 186824 bringing the price per 10K down to 1531 Impressive. Not only that, tell them what's in the garage right now. The Civic Type R. Yeah. yeah that's right. I forgot they dropped that off. <laughs> and it's snowing. Yeah, which is not great. And it's on, like, performance <laughs> it's summer, summer tires. tires. It's, it's, we're, we're, hopefully it'll dry up enough to where we can take it to the track. We're hoping. We'll see uh, what happens. Interestingly enough, Nathan, um, three of the top five cars are small sedans in that class. Mm -hmm. So that class is, is not only long-lasting but relatively affordable, and that's going to put it right at the top of the list. Um, number four, we got the Honda Accord um, coming in at $30,321 average new car price. Wow, that's way below the overall average of forty seven. dollars I thought people were paying more for Accords. I think for hybrids are paying a lot. Oh, my nephew just bought an Accord hybrid uh, last year, is, and he paid uh, I think uh, about thirty-eight. Um, average lifespan two hundred eleven thousand miles. Mm -hmm. Long-lasting car, one thousand four hundred thirty-two dollars per ten thousand miles. It's a long, it's a long-lasting car. It's a good car. Yeah. it really is. I know. I don't know how many people out there are hip to the new design. I'm curious. I'm on the fence about it. Um, number three. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's it, it's a little bland. I like the front end. But I, 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 yeah, it's something about the uh, profile. It just doesn't quite work with me. I also it's miss the coupe. Remember the coupe? Was oh, cool. man, that was so much fun, yeah. especially with the V6. With the manual, mm -hmm. manual V6 coupe. That thing hauled. It's a hot car. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it needs all-wheel drive, in my opinion. Yes. Um, it could really use it. Um, number three does have all-wheel drive. It's the Subaru Impreza. 
making the top three Subaru, $27,830 average new car price, average lifespan, $197,562. I believe the Impreza is one of the least expensive all-wheel drive cars you can get in that class. Very true, yeah. It got a little bit more expensive than the new generation, mm -hmm. still pretty affordable. That brings the price per 10,000 miles down to 1,409. All right, top two, Nathan. Number two is the Toyota Corolla. Average new car price, $25,000 almost exactly, and the average lifespan is 182,000 miles, bringing the price per 10,000 miles down to 1,374. You think about the Corolla, more so than even the Civic, there are more powertrain and body choices out there than any other vehicle in its class. You can get the GR, which is the hatchback super supercar, essentially. Yep. You can get a all-wheel drive, uh, I think hybrid, hybrid yep. which you tested on the roller test. Excellent car. Um, the front-wheel drive, you can reg regular one, hatchback, uh, sedan. Yeah, I mean, there's just several different options out there. I, like the, I, It's still pretty dull in the sedan form. But now with that hybrid and all-wheel drive, you can pick one up for like 23, 24 grand. Um, it's incredible fuel economy, like 47, 48 MPG. All-wheel drive so you can get through snow. Great rear seat room if you want to do ride sharing. I mean, what a car. You know, standard safety sense. Solid, good, little car. Yeah. And, and Toyota's really hit it out of the park with that one. And of course, the GR is still one of my absolute favorite cars of last year. Yeah. And then number one is not only the cheapest car to own based on the average new car price and the lifespan, it's also one of the most mocked cars of... Um, it is one of the most disliked cars out there. It's yeah. one of the least powerful cars you By can buy. By far. It is the Mitsubishi Mirage. It's the yes. number one best new car for the money according to the IC car study. Um, and part of that is because it's by far the cheapest new car on this list. $18,991 is the average new car price for Mirage. Yep. But don't think it's lasting only 50,000, 60,000 miles. The average lifespan is still 172,784 miles. I am a champion for this car for people who don't have money. Um, we, we've actually done a couple of videos, just a couple, where we spotlighted the car, we used it kind of as a gag because it is very, very inexpensive. Although there's a funny irony with this car. <laughs> you get more standard features with this really inexpensive little car than you do with a lot of vehicles that cost twice as much. Hmm. A couple things. First of all, we are very much aware that this is its last year of production. So yes, this list is technically kind of old school if you think about it that way. It, they, unfortunately, they're going away. Um, the sedan was dreadful to look at, I agree. And really not a lot of power. Um, I believe the last version of this car, uh, just CVT, but maybe they still have some holdover manual transmissions from 23, um, I think, maybe. I think 23 was its final model year. They're, um, they're still in the last Oh, one. no, you're right. 2024 yeah. is still around, yeah. um, but uh, yeah. Limited, good luck, uh, you know, Getting them, but here's here's the good news. Um, for years and years and years since the Mirage came out, I knew that that little tiny tiny powertrain was extremely efficient and more importantly reliable. And even though it does have a continuously variable transmission as as really its main volume seller, it works. It works quite a long time. And Mitsubishi actually has decent warranties as well. So for those of you who right now are looking for a very cheap, inexpensive vehicle that gets killer mileage has a decent warranty and if you don't care about horsepower this car is not horrible uh in that respect uh it's not that comfortable it is not fast uh not great on the highway except for mileage and if you get hit by a semi it's all over however now that they no longer show, sell the chevy uh spark and I believe now that the Versa has gone up in price, this is one of the least expensive vehicles in America. So I got a list here of the cheapest cars in 2024. Number one, still the Versa at 16130. Oh, so you can still get one for cheaper. Yeah, but number two is the Mirage at 16695. And I bet you, you probably could get a Mirage brand new for less than that. I mean, look, what the shame about this car is like, yes, it, it, it was the butt of many jokes because it had this little tiny buzzy three cylinder. Um, but, you know, we, we still need cheap cars right, in the U.S. And yeah. We still need cheap, long-lasting cars. And finding a car nowadays brand new for under 20, I mean, 20 grand is a new 10 grand of like 10 it, years it ago. It really is, and right? it's a real shame. 
Um, it wasn't that long ago when you could get a $14,000 car with air, air conditioning. And it was like, oh yeah, there you go. They can't even do that now. Um, so look, I have a lot of respect that they've kept the Mirage around this long. Mm. They've improved it a little bit, got new nose. There's a rally art version if you want to get a little spicy with it. <laughs> yeah, the wheels uh, and stripes, and I think. stickers and stripes, stickers. you got it, yeah. yeah. Um, but look, folks, like, even though it was the butt of many of journalists' jokes throughout the years, average lifespan is still 172. Like, that's a long-lasting, affordable car. Yes, and I believe you get um, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. You have to plug it in. I don't think it's wireless. And you, it comes with the screen, and it comes standard with air conditioning. So it's not a completely stripped-down model like the old days, too. So I'm not trying to say go out and buy one. I'm just saying that if you're looking for something that we've proven, at least on paper, that has a pretty good track record with reliability and giving you most bang for the buck for those of you who just need basic transportation and you don't want an electric car, that might be a good choice. And look, I mean, really, the Mirage and the Versa at this point for their price points are really competing against used cars. Yes. Um, and you might think, well, just go get a used Camry, but some people want that 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty Mitsubishi offers. Um, it's got five-year unlimited roadside assistance, two-year, 30,000-mile limited maintenance. Like, there's a lot of stuff that is beneficial of Think buying Think about a what car. you're getting for the entry price, too. Yeah, I mean, it's, right. it's, it's a lot of little car for that price. And so that's one of the things that I, I really am trying to, I've always tried to move towards what is considered affordable for people who just simply don't have fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 to throw into a car. Right. So, so look, there it is. I, yeah, I mean, it's uh, to your point, Nathan, not a great car, um, but it is a car that with a new warranty and lights and turn signals and air conditioning, and that's gonna be reliable. Yeah. Um, so folks, we'd love to hear your feedback as to what cars you've owned that you felt have been the best new cars for the money or used cars for the money. Um, be sure to drop us a comment below. We'd love to, to re we read just about every comment. Absolutely. Guys, have a wonderful week. We will see you next week. And check out alltfl.com for the latest and greatest in new podcasts.